Having studied ancient philosophy for a long time and Stoicism as my favorite of all of the ancient philosophies, um, my approach has always been in, in the classroom and in, in my own writing to start with the primary sources, right? Because they're the origin of Stoic thought and Stoic thinking has had a long and famous history since then. But I really think it's, it's just vital to start with what the original Stoics said on a subject and then build from there as we tailor their ideas to our needs and our concerns um, as contemporary thinkers and contemporary intellectuals today. So that said, it just absolutely has to be emphasized, it seems to me, that living in accordance with or living in agreement with nature, living in as they say in the Greek, this is how the original ancient Stoics defined the very goal, the telos of human life. So to try to subtract that or remove that definition as too problematic or too confusing or too antiquated or too naive given our contemporary scientific understanding in a post-Darwinian, post-evolutionary, perhaps post-theological um, or, or, you know, uh, you know um, uh, non-religious secular setting, um, I think is, is a fundamental mistake from the get-go because if we want to modify the Stoics' understanding of the role of reason in human life, do that after a firm understanding of what, what reason was for them and how it was grounded in human nature and then the relationship between human reason and the cosmos as a whole, the natural world, the universe. So that's why I think it's just vital to start with living in agreement with nature. So as we talked about last time, um, this is actually a very rich concept for the ancient Stoics. Nature is polyvalent, right? It has many different layers of meaning, right? Mm. So uh, more, most broadly construed, nature we could conceive of as nature with a capital N, right? Mm. Meaning the entire natural world. So this extends beyond planet Earth into the solar system and the entire universe as we understand it. Mm. So can for, I just pause you there for one second? Yeah. Cause I have to, I have to emphasize that point. I've had this conversation with people where I say like, uh, okay, so what you need to understand is that you're not separate from nature. Right. And, and right. that you are an active part of nature. And then they say, right. well, okay, well imagine if they took us off the planet, like the planet would still keep on going. And I'm like, yeah, you can take us off the planet, but that doesn't mean you're taking us out of nature. Nature encompasses the entire cosmos, right? right and no matter exactly. where you take human beings, they will always be somewhere within that realm of nature, right? It's impossible yes, to take the elements of our body out of this whole scheme of life. And I just, because yes. we, we too often think of nature as planet Earth, right? And that's just not what it is. Right, right. So very good. So in, in fact, I mean, uh, Stoics offering Stoicism as a way of life for all human beings, all rational adult human beings, would apply equally to astronauts, right? So mm. if we have space travelers that are going to Mars, right? Or, or if you're a, a movie fan, as I am, as many people are, uh, you will have enjoyed Matt Damon's movie, right? And his setting in that movie, I don't know if you know the movie, but his setting being isolated, being stranded there all by himself and having to science the hell out of a myriad practical problems and not to be demoralized and to continue persevering and problem solving and using his cognitive abilities to survive and sustain himself and, and actually grow food and so forth. What a, what a perfect opportunity for him to exercise basic Stoic principles, right? Mm. Even on another planet, even when he's yeah. all by himself, when his technology breaks down and he's got to fix stuff. Mm. So yeah, so if there's space travelers, I mean, Stoics in space, 
yeah, where it's not just limited to the biosphere. Well, that's a good so, point, right? Because it, you, you, you go into a different planet and you're not going to say, well, I should just be able to plant corn and it should be able to grow, right? You're going to say, okay, what's, what are the natural laws of this current ecosystem uh, exactly. that run this whole thing? And once I understand the physics, like the Stoics started to understand, right? If I can understand the physics, then I can understand how I can mold my actions to be in alignment with those physics so that I have the best chance of survival and thriving, right? Right. And, and this, is, this is the deeply pragmatic or pra practical um, aspect of Stoicism, right? If you can't practice the philosophy, then it's useless. Yeah. And you do need to study the, the theory. You do, not, you do need to understand uh, Stoic physics and Stoic logic and speech and, and principles of persuasive reasoning and rhetoric, be rhetorically so sophisticated in communicating with other people. Uh, those other two branches of Stoicism are very important too, but it has to be a philosophy you can live or else you're not gonna be able to, to flourish. You're not gonna be able to benefit from a mm. philosophy if it's not practical and eminently practical as Stoicism is, right, and from the beginning. Right. So, uh, right. So living in agreement with nature, living in agreement with the cosmos, the, the, the totality of the all, the ancients called it, right? The, the whole thing, the universe. Um, and that's where the unfolding of events is the, the sort of cosmic challenge, right? How do we adapt and cope with each event as it occurs to us? following the natural laws that you mentioned on whichever planet we're in, whether we're in a spaceship or on the beach or self-isolating at home uh, because of a pandemic, right? Um, and so that's the kind of cosmic or astronomical, if you will, sense of nature with the biggest capital M, the flow of events mm. in the universe. But nature... Also, another layer of nature is much more fundamentally at the level of our planet and within the biosphere, right? Within this thin sphere of life that's teeming with life mm -hmm. on, our, on, our, on our planet. So living in agreement with nature in that sense means living in agreement with biology mm -hmm. and specifically biological processes. Right. And so as living beings and as mammals and as primates, human beings have biological parameters within which we have to operate in order to survive long enough to reproduce if we choose to reproduce. Right. And mm. sustain ourselves every day. We have to have oxygen. We have to have water. Plenty of it right? Every day, we have to have some kind of food, right? And we also need more than that, right? We need exercise in order for our bodies and our constitutions, our, our physiology, our physiological apparatus to operate properly and to keep our immune system strong, which means that we have to get enough sleep every night, right? So you got to hydrate, you got to exercise, you got to get good quality sleep every night, and washing your hands, always yeah. a good idea. <laughs> during the pandemic more than ever, right? Yeah. So living in agreement with nature then means living in agreement with our biological nature as animals. So we have to eat like other animals do. We have to sleep like they do. We have to move around like they do, right? Other mammals, right? But as primates, as other primates are social and live together in groups, it's not a distinctly human feature of our human nature, our human biology, that we congregate, that we associate with others of our kind, because other primates do that too. Yeah. And we communicate with each other as other primates too, right? And we use tools as other primates too, right? Mm. So then we're off and running with the construction of human society, human communal living, right? What is living in agreement with our communal nature going to require of us? Well, it requires that we develop techniques for resolving conflict, mm. right? Resolving strife, because this disrupts the social fabric, 
of human living. And Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Epictetus all talk about the importance of getting along with other people, right? Cooperating, yeah. not just getting along in the sense that you go do your thing, I'll stay over here and do my thing and we'll try not to knock heads together. No, for the Stoics, they have this very organic, cohesive notion of human community in which we help each other. We participate in communal living each contributing our own skills and abilities to help each other live well, right? Mm. And this is not, again, strictly limited to Stoic thinking, but Platonists and Aristotelians also emphasize the necessity of social living. Or we can't flourish, we can't thrive as human beings if we're in social isolation, right? Yeah. And so then you also have the other sciences that we know, um, shed light on our understanding of nature. So chemistry and biochemistry, mm. right? And the importance of vitamins and micronutrients and all the rest of the stuff. So, you know, some diets are gonna be healthier for us than others. So living in agreement with our, our understanding of nutritional science is gonna mean, you know, not eating cheesy pizza and ice cream four times a day and drinking and mm. washing it down with milkshakes because that's just not going to allow us to thrive and be healthy, right? Yeah. So we, we draw from our knowledge of nutrition and, and so forth. So that's- This is, exact, that's this is exactly why I, I take such issue with people who say, who, or who still cling to those quotes that say, you know, the body is out of your control, you know? And so really it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, well, I mean, if you're trying to align with nature, you should want to take care of your body because your body is literally the house for your brain, your ability to reason, your ability to Absolutely. think. And, and it just doesn't make sense that, that anyone who's, who's trying to align with these stoic principles would, would not want to take care of their body to the best of their abilities because it's the right. very vehicle that allows you to move through this world. Right. And, right, and exactly. so, yeah, I just, I hear too many times. It's like, okay, the body's out of your control. Well, there are certain elements that are out of your control. Um, but if you use your reasoning capabilities, uh, then you can actually help your body to be strong and healthy and, and fit. And, and, and that always leads to a better reasoning capacity. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, mm. and, and again, this is the flexibility. I mean, if it's the case that you have an injury, or maybe you you were you had a congenital um, you know condition from birth that didn't allow you to develop your limbs or you know certain organs required you know surgical attention or you have to take you know special uh, medicines in order to digest your food or see clearly or whatever it is um, yeah that's a matter of ad adapting to what is up to you right it's the decision making is up to you it's me. Mm effort to uh, collect information to inform your decisions. And once you make your decisions and you attempt your actions, then yes, how that plays out outside of your Epictetus with prohiresis, right? Outside of your, your volition, right? Or choice. Yeah, that's not up to you, right? So, you know, once you put the food into your body and you're digesting it, it's up to you whether you try to purge, right? You can try to throw up, but once it's yeah. being digested, it's not really up to you how it's gonna affect your body, right? Mm. So yeah, so all the time, yeah, you wanna get back to this, this dichotomy of control, what's up to you and what's not. But as you say, I mean, we're, we're part of nature. And so remembering that the Stoics are physicalists, they don't believe that you are some sort of ghostly intellect that's loosely connected to this fleshy thing, right? They believe that you know you your your soul is a physical thing that's a very you know airy, right? That mm. that's, that provides this this tautness inside your body and it causally interacts with it. But the soul is understood as a physical entity that's dispersed throughout another kind of physical entity, your body. Um, mm. And the two together constitute what you are. So they, is that, is that what they call physicalists? 
Is that what they called the Logos? The Logos was the thing that was essentially making this whole thing work, everything work. Is, is that what they talked about when they talked about the soul or is it different? No, the, the, what I was referring to is, I mean, the Greek there is, uh, well, sometimes they, they use the word suke, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, P-S-Y-C-H-E. Um, but uh, the Stoic standing of the soul involves this command center, the hegemonicon. That's what controls um, your five senses, your power of speech, and your reproductive powers. So vision, smelling, hearing, uh, uh, taste, touch. Um, is that five? Vision, smelling, hearing, taste, touch. And then your power of speech, that's going to be logos, right? Speech, mm. rational utterance and then your uh, procreative or reproductive powers. Those are the seven, seven, bio- or seven physical functions, physical powers that the hegemonicon um, controls, that the ruling mm. faculty controls of your soul. Right? Yeah, okay. Whereas logos, I mean, this, you know, the core meaning there is rational utterance. So it's, it's intimately connected with speech, but it's also the, internal faculty by which you can think, reason, interpret your sensory stimuli, and uh, is this principle not only with regard to your mind or intellect, but also um, in the cosmos, right? The cosmos is organized according to this kind of pattern of regularity and orderliness that is uh, the cosmic reason, cosmic logos. Yeah, yeah, okay.